So hello to you wherever you're joining us from. We've got a truly a, a worldwide audience today. So I'd like to uh, welcome our international audience for this very special episode of our Ace Aware Nation conversation. It's our first of uh, 2021. Uh, so if you're a regular, Happy New Year to you. If you're new to the whole series, Happy New Year to you as well, wherever you are in the world. Tonight, today, we're discussing trauma at the heart of Scotland's drug uh, deaths and this is on the back of the news as I'm sure many of you know that uh, uh, the news that was released I think just before Christmas about having the highest uh, drug deaths in Europe uh, also beyond the UK averages as well and actually what is going on and what can we do who's making the decisions who's listening uh, or indeed who's not listening and what are the alternatives available to Scotland uh, as we head through 2021 to try and get on top of this tragedy. Um, our guest Guest tonight, James Doherty, survivor, member of the Violence Reduction Unit based in Glasgow in Scotland. Uh, Darren McGarvey, I'm delighted to say, is with us as well, author, social commentator and survivor. And Amory Ward, who's the Chief Executive Officer of Faces uh, and Voices of Recovery UK. Good evening to you all and thank you for, for joining us today um, and joining this, uh, this international audience. Um, Amory Ward, if I could start with you, uh, welcome. Thank you for joining us. As, as I said, could you tell me a little bit about your organisation and what it does, uh, Faces uh, and Voices of Recovery UK? Sure, yeah, I'd be delighted to. So we are a national UK-wide charity. We have 4,500 members made up of people in recovery and their friends and families. About 700 of those are based in Scotland. We are a national advocacy charity and our purpose is to advocate for better access to addiction treatment services and for more choice in addiction treatment services. We've been operational since 2009 and we got charity status in 2012. So yeah, we're still here and uh, we're still trying to raise and amplify recovering people's voices so as we are visible, valuable and very, very vocal. Thank you for that, Anne-Marie. Come back to you in just a moment or two. Uh, Darren McGarvey. Darren, thank you for joining us uh, this evening. It's very much appreciated. Um, many, many people, I'm sure, on this broadcast this evening know who you are and, and are very aware of your work. For those of, uh, of the audience who may be new to, to you and your work, uh, could you just tell us a little bit about you and what you do? Uh, I am Darren, obviously. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Uh, the international audience will give me a great opportunity to put my uh, elocution lessons to good use. Um, hopefully soon, Gary, I'll have as trusted an accent as yourself. Um, I <clears throat> grew up in a working class area, the typical story, area of multiple deprivation, bore the scars of that, had a lot of adversity in my teens, homelessness, drug addiction, da-da-da-da-da. Uh, subsequently, I went on to... Uh, delivered youth work and arts education uh, and then became a writer and then everything that I'm doing now is, is sort of coming from from that really so I, I'm at a place now where I don't do as much of the frontline work although I'm invited in often which is a nice opportunity for me just to keep close to that stuff uh, I think now I'm in a position where uh, what I'm trying to do is amplify what I believe are are, are, are the essential voices and and put forward the essential arguments. Wonderful. Thank you, Darren. Uh, and uh, James Doherty. James, it's great to see you. Uh, we've, we've worked together previously, particularly uh, on the 2019 Ace Aware Nation conference in Glasgow uh, with, uh, with Gabo Matty. I think it's yeah. the same, same question for you, James, if you don't mind. Lots of people on this uh, vodcast tonight will know who you are. They'll recognize <clears> you. They'll see your work. Uh, you're prolific on social media, but for those who are new to you, can you just give us a little bit of an overview about yourself? So, I'm very much like Darren. I grew up and faced some of the similar circumstances to Darren and um, managed to overcome a lot of my adversity and decided that once I'd overcome that adversity, I was going to try and create the conditions and so pe support people past the same adversity. So, my movement really was in a violence prevention, so I worked in the violence reduction unit. In my, the violence reduction unit basically looks at violence through a public health lens. And um, 
So we look at the broad range of preventable consequences in our society, such as early adverse childhood experiences, harmful social and community experiences, and all the influences that come from that. So my movement in there was basically primarily to tackle the gang problem in Glasgow. We had a big gang problem at the time. And I've been there ever since because I love the I love it today and I get the whole public health approach. And in my journey in there as well, I realised that many of the issues that drive people into violence were the same that were driving people into addictions. And that's why I'm so vocal on trauma and addiction. Well, it's great to have all all three of you here uh, this evening. So thank you very much indeed. And I think it's fair to say that while you're all prolific uh, in terms of the work that you do, you're very vocal, particularly in Scotland and and have high profiles, you're still all at the sharp end of what's going on. Anne-Marie, you'll see people every single day that are turning to you for help. Uh, What is the situation? What What is your charity finding currently as we head into 2021? Uh, well, even tonight, I was talking to Mark Moody, who is the CEO of Change Grow Live, which is one of the biggest, or in fact, the biggest provider in England and Wales. And we were both commenting that even more so now than ever, our phones are running off the hook with people seeking help. Um, we've never at any point in the history of my organisation or his had as many people trying to access treatment. Um, so from from where I'm sitting just now as well, at no point in my own professional career or as a person in recovery, I, I didn't mention my own personal experience when I introduced myself. I am a person in long term recovery, and for me that I mean that means sorry that I haven't used alcohol or other drugs for almost 24 years now. And at no point in those 24 years have I been aware of the amount of people dying. Um, or committing suicide, it's much, much higher. I would say it's at least three times higher than at any other year and at any other point um, that I've experienced in those 23 to almost 24 years in recovery. Uh, and people just have not got access in the way that they did pre-pandemic, but even pre-pandemic, service access and service choice was extremely limited. So, yeah, I just think in terms of where we're at now, it's horrific, guys. It's really horrific, and it's only going to get worse. Well, let's have a look at some of those those top-line figures that were were reported uh, towards the end of last year. Uh, 1,264 deaths, up 6%. Uh, it's been well reported, as we know. Uh, males making up um, 69% of those, of those deaths, uh, unfortunately. That's, that's 7 out of 10. Um, 68% of those aged between 35 and 54, um, higher than any other UK, yeah, sorry, EU country, and 3.5 times higher uh, than the UK as a, a whole. Um, Darren, in, in your experience, has Scotland, did, did Scotland get better and then has got worse? Or has this been a, has this been a gradual story of of where we are now so have have we had a peak and a trough and are we peaking again or i think the trend i think the i think the trend to be honest has has just been uh downward in terms of whether it's increasing deaths or whether it's the the widening inequalities um then we are we are at a point now where i think it, it would hopefully become politically easier for politicians and established uh, institutions with vested interests to become more open to more radical solutions. That's certainly why I was so vocal in in, uh, holding former Minister for Drugs, Joe Fitzpatrick, to account. I recognise he's not personally responsible for the problem but there was an opportunity there to, to bloody the, the nose of the government. And that is very important uh, in this wider struggle because history tells us that change doesn't come from politicians. It comes from social movements uh, that put pressure on them. And the less wriggle room that they feel they have, then the better. Uh, this crisis, in my view, and Anne-Marie and James know a lot more on, on much of the detail, but in terms of the overarching big picture stuff, 
the drug crisis for me is a, is a cocktail of three main ingredients. So there's a, at first a systemic misunderstanding of the phenomenon of addiction uh, at public level, institutional level. And so, you know, this leads to all sorts of misconceptions about it being a personal choice, it being a moral failing, the idea that it's not an illness. Uh, the second is, is the, the massive class disparity between the people who are predominantly impacted by poverty and just addiction, death and despair, and those who hold the power to do something about it. And the third is that, uh, until very recently, there is no real accountability for failure, and this is uh, at every level. Uh, right up until to, to cabinet government cabinet level so addicts unlike other every other cross section of the, the population lack even the most basic human rights basic choice when it comes to their health care if they are mistreated or let down or die as a result of systemic or human error there are a few mechanisms that exist to identify and rectify that and we see this also where it comes to homelessness you know people can be evicted from their homes given no explanation and they can't actually get a hold of someone to find out what's going on this just wouldn't be uh, acceptable to a, a, a politically enfranchised economically confident middle class uh, voter so I don't understand why it's acceptable uh, to anyone else I think ultimately that the, the, there's a lot of ideological friction within this broader drug sector the recovery movement you've got the kind of pharmacological approaches uh, I recognize that a lot of the language has been very heated lately uh, but certainly I would just like to say that I, I would hope that going forward um, then uh, I, I certainly would be doing my bit to de-escalate some of the rhetoric that I was engaged in in recognition that, that uh, we do now have a bit of impetus again around this issue with a new ministerial position being created and what seems at least rhetorically to be some fresh energy. So are, are you confident about this new appointment of uh, Angela Constance? Uh, no, what I mean is that the chain of accountability now goes directly to Butte House, which is the First Minister. So she has been forced to intervene directly, which means that a new range of solutions will become available. New resources that we were told didn't exist are going to be uh, discussed now. Uh, and this has happened before, although I don't remember a minister being uh, invited to resign. But uh, there's, there's been previous moments where a line seems to have been drawn and there's been some lovely mood music about how we move forward. But I think a lot of us are now wise to that political cycle and we understand now how this should be played in a number of ways. It's not just about engaging constructively, it's also being uh, prepared to fight quite dirty sometimes because uh, that's what politicians do. Uh, and just for our international audience uh, to just to qualify that, that Angela Constance is the new drug minister who uh, who's taken over from um, uh, from the previous drug minister, Joe Fitzpatrick, Joe Fitzpatrick. forgive me. Yeah. Um, so so and I think it's a new, it's a, a brand new post as well. Um, Darren, thank you. James, what's what's your view on what uh, what Darren's just said? Yeah, I totally agree with everything Dan said. Like, I listen to some of the rhetoric, even across the media, in regards to how how the ministers are dealing with this. And I don't hear language of um, how do we cultivate uh, a culture of compassion and empathy? How do we recognise the causes and conditions that are underpinning addiction and try to educate people societally, at a societal level about what underpins chronic addiction? Because it's, um, it's well researched that Bessel van der Kolk is telling us that the ACE study is the single most preventable common cause of drug and alcohol abuse, along with other issues like suicidality, mental health, um, and some illnesses. And there's not, there's not even that was why I wanted to bring attention to how the the role that trauma plays and being one of the major drivers for addiction. And also poverty as well. Poverty is an adverse childhood experiences, experience, and there's no getting away from that. And we know that poverty exudes massive stress on a family system, which in turn debilitates their ability to emotionally regulate because you've got parents who are totally stressed out their mind, who can't emotionally regulate, and it might be affect, affecting their behaviour, and certain needs take pre precedence over other needs and it's the children in that rearing environment who develop mentally uh, pay the ultimate cost so most adverse 
childhood experiences are done unwittingly. It's never about blaming parents, shaming parents or disgracing parents. And I think that's one of the big reasons why people don't want to talk about trauma and adverse childhood experiences, Gary, because they think it's about blame. When it's not, it's the search for understanding. Why are things the way they are? So it needs to look at how do we prevent these issues from arising in the first place and fundamentally look at the recovery process from trauma and, and addiction because the two of them are usually dovetailing together. Uh, Marie, it's, it's interesting um, the language used uh, and, and Darren talking about giving uh, the, the government, if you like, a, a bloody nose. Do you think that that's, that's the way forward in order to get action done as opposed to what could have been previously made more of a softly, softly approach? Um, I think over the years, um, you know, certainly with regards to my charity, we tried a, quite a softly, softly approach trying to celebrate recovery, put forward the role that there are many pathways to recovery and that all are a cause for celebration, not just the ones the government pay for or support. Um, and I think even, even if we bring it into the analogy using an addiction analogy, like in order for things to change, I had to reach a rock bottom. And my rock bottom, I had a pretty bloody nose. And, and and sometimes that's what it takes. You know, we may well have got to that point now where government ministers and your treatment system is ready to change. I welcome the new minister and I welcome the opportunity to build a relationship that is based on support and friendship and compassion Rather than adversity and bloody noses, um, I think the, the new minister, Angela Constance, who I'm hoping will tune in at some point to this, um, has the opportunity to talk to people like me who have recovered and who have got no institutional, financial or organisational interest and helping people get access and choice. You know, there's very few voices of lived experience that aren't acting as double agents at the moment. You know, most of the lived experience that she has access to will have an organisational, institutional or financial interest, and we don't. So I would love to, you know, give her the opportunity to, to talk to people who have not only been in recovery for a couple of decades, but, you know, guys and girls who are still accessing or having difficulty accessing services all across Scotland. Um, so, yeah, I think I think we do need to be talking about especially prevention. We don't have any prevention programmes anymore in Scotland. When, when I started using drugs at the age of 13, it was Zamo and Just Say No. That was as much as it got, you know. And at that point, you know, early in my life, I believe that drugs saved my life. I was brought up in a home that was alcoholic, it was violent, there was sexual abuse happening to myself. Um, and, and at that, you know, when I found alcohol and other drugs, it was such a relief. I do believe that they saved my life until I got to a point where they started to take any sort of living that I could possibly take part in away from me. So there has to be a recognition that addiction serves a purpose. It can help people until it stops helping people. Um, and, and when I then needed to get well, the, the places that were available to me to get well and the place that was available to me in particular that was open 24-7, that particular pathway has to be available to other people and not to be shunned upon or, you know, prejudice against. There's a massive evidence base for the pathway that I got well in, which is mutual aid, 12-step um, recovery. But we've, we see so much prejudice against it, you know, and, and it really is contempt prior to investigation from most of the so-called addiction professionals. Darren, that's, a, that's another interesting word, prejudice, which I, I think we can all suffer from from time to time. And, and I, I certainly don't want to turn this into a, um, a Scottish government bashing session at all. Uh, however, you know, we will come back to this. But how much responsibility or what role does the general public, so people like me, Darren, uh, have to play in this? You know, so surely it's not just down to the decision makers. We'll, once again, we'll come on to that. But what about Joe Public? What have they got to do in order to turn this this trend around? Well, a, a significant proportion of the public are dealing with the impact of addiction, either directly or indirectly. 
So that's important to understand. The addiction, alcoholism, the attendant challenges around those behaviours, uh, they are they are felt by most people in this country to some extent. Uh, obviously, they will be expressed more severely in areas where, in households and communities where the economic and emotional resources do not exist to mitigate or ameliorate the difficulties, the downward spirals that can occur. Um, but ultimately, we 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 are currently a, a, a shift in our culture. You you can you can determine roughly where public opinion on certain issues is by the editorial position of the main tabloids in a country. So if you look at where the Daily Record now sits in terms of this debate, uh, then you can see quite clearly that this idea that you can treat drug addiction with punitive measures uh, is, is being exposed as a myth. And it takes people a while to come round to confronting prejudices, and we do all have them, you're absolutely correct. Uh, but I think we are at a particular moment in, in, in Scottish culture where even uh, journal, even uh, news outlets and, and tabloids that you, you would uh, regard as extremely unsympathetic historically to people uh, living in poverty have begun to recognise not because of their own moral character, because tabloids basically just reflect what they feel are the values of their readers. So when a newspaper's slant changes, particularly a newspaper that's been historically hostile, then it shows that even in sections of the population where uh, punitive measures seem most natural, where drug deaths or uh, where drug addiction is concerned, we're seeing that shift. And so that's why this is a really important moment. This will be a very important year going forward. Also, this, uh, this uh, global pandemic has been a gift and a curse at the same time. Uh, it's, been a, it's been a curse because it has put an accelerator pedal down on a lot of the trends that we have been seeing uh, in recent years with respect to public health, mental health, uh, economic inequalities, and all of the various metrics that historically have been used to justify the economic status quo. You know, this 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 capitalist society is great. Look at life expectancy. Uh, look at the dropping suicide rate. Look at child mortality. Look at this, look at that. And actually these metrics now are all flashing red, you know. So if these were used to justify the current status quo previously, then the fact that they're flashing red shows that we have to have a fundamental rethink about it. But the, 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 the gift in this is that a lot of the arguments that, that many of us have been making uh, about the nature of the inequalities, particularly the inequalities around social class, which I believe remains the best way to describe uh, the differential outcomes between people from different backgrounds. We're talking about class. It's an old concept, but it's still the best one we have. And if COVID-19 and everything else has ta taught us anything, it's taught us that that remains the primary dividing line within our society. And it's good that that now is no longer up for debate because I think that helps us to move forward with a bit of uh, clarity. James, the, the, the COVID-19 situation, of course, is adding even more stress now onto families in Scotland and indeed all over the world. What, what danger is there here as well in terms of putting more stress on individuals and families, leading to more addiction issues and to more deaths? Well, the research and the evidence is telling us that the vulnerability of addiction comes in the person, not the drug. So if we'd, an over, if we'd an overdose of focus on drugs, we've even got services called drug this, drug that, drug this. So there's too much an emphasis on the symptom in my lighting. And um, what people fail to understand is that if the Adverse Childhood Experience Study is telling us that that's your greatest um, predisposition for ending up vulnerable to addiction, then... The science is telling us that basically the, the AC study is about an overdose of stress. So it's a, a person who has too much stress and a quality of 
causes stress and poverty causes stress. COVID has put the volume up on it because it's asking us to dislocate for contact with other human beings. We're a social animal, so we need to be with other human beings. That's what doses down the stress in people's lives. Mm -hmm. So there's going to be more drug deaths. The drug deaths next year will be off the scale because of these um, these fo these blind forces at play. But it's no COVID's fault. It would be easy to blame COVID. The vulnerability of addiction came in the person. That's why people are baffled, Gary, why some people can experiment with substances as a teenager, take a wee drink of this, a wee smoke of that, and they don't all become drug addicts. So why is it some people do and most people don't? And as Darren was saying a minute ago about punishing these people, you will never punish trauma into a better way of being in the world because look at the life experience. The life's already been a punishing enough experience. So adding more pain in their life and more stress is basically only going to push them towards what helps relieve that stress, stress which is drugs. Drugs are painkillers. So the more pain you put a person in, the more they'll need to seek relief. And that's why Berlini is not the best rehab in Europe. Anne-Marie, um, addiction comes in all sorts of different forms. I mean, we're talking we're talking about, about drugs tonight, but we know there's alcohol, there's sex, there's gambling. I mean, even Gabor Mati in his book talked about being addicted to classical music uh, and spending, whether it was 5000 or 8000 dollars on on it until his wife uh intervened are we are we as a society amory more forgiving of 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 certain addictions above others absolutely it's a bit snobbery isn't it so my crack pipe and your bottle of bougie it's just the same thing it's escapism you know or whether it's dragon soup or a needle full of heroin it's just escapism and now, some of the points that have been raised tonight around what I would describe in my personal experience was intergenerational trauma. My mother felt abandoned and rejected when she was given to a aunt when her mother got tuberculosis, my grandmother, and had to go to a sanatorium. And my grandmother was uh, illegitimate, you know. And, and, and what that resulted in was, you know, four generations of addict alcoholic women that I'm aware of who did their absolute best um, to bring up their children, but they were severely traumatised and, and used alcohol um, and prescription drugs for much of their adult life. Um, and, and what I've been able to do, because I was able to access, not just through 12-step recovery, um, my, my first sponsor in 12-step recovery was a cognitive behavioural and psychodynamic therapist and I had access to that type of care and help 24-7 for the first three years of my recovery. So I have a, I can tell you now that I have a 19, almost 19 year old son and I told you a wee bit about my own background where it was extremely violent. I grew up in fear all the time um, and I can count on one hand the amount of times I've raised my voice at my child so and I've never raised my hand to him you know so that's what recovery and good trauma therapy has done for me it has broke that intergenerational cycle of addiction and if you're looking at that from a cost benefit analysis to the public purse that's phenomenal you know I'm not at the GPs looking for you know drugs to help. I'm not stealing. I'm, you know, I'm a con con productive contributing member of society. Whereas, you know, generations of women in my family weren't able to do that to their full capacity, you know, and that that's essentially what we need to do here. It's about prevention. It's about, about getting kids at their earliest stage. I knew instinctively being a mother was the most important job in the world. I studied, that's been, a, I was telling James the other night, my first career, you know, even throughout my addiction was I had the old NNEB qualification in childcare. I knew it was the most important job in the world. 
Um, and if we can focus our efforts, and I do think the Scottish Government is doing their best to do that, um, but really focus our efforts in those early years, we will make a difference. The intergenerational trauma will be tackled, but certainly we need to we need to do a lot more and a lot better than what we're doing just now. And Maria, I just want to stick with you for just a second, then I want to come back to the media question with Darren. Um, I did see some... Um, some reports in the Daily Record campaign was talking about decriminalisation. Uh, I think decrim is probably the better word because I can never get I can never get the word out. But decrim, and you know, you open the paper or any paper, but you can have a look at the Daily Record and you can see the graph of where Scotland sits against the rest of the UK and Portugal and so on and so forth. You've actually been in other European countries where they've talked about decrim, for instance. Um, just Can you just give me a little bit of background about that? You, you spoke before we went live about a country you were in that seems to get lots of plaudits about decrim, but actually they've, the, 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 the support network, the support system around that is much stronger than we have here. Could you just explain a little bit about that? Sure. So I mean, we're referring to the Portuguese model, um, and I was also talking about the drug consumption room that I visited in Copenhagen, which I found deeply, deeply upsetting. Um, but, you know, that's maybe another story for another day. But the, the two things that the Portuguese model have and the Copenhagen drug consumption room have um, is if you go there to use any of their services, you have instant access on the hour access to rehabilitation. Now, if that's what we want to do in Scotland, we currently only have 22 funded rehab beds for the whole of Scotland. We've got 365 beds available. A hundred of those um, are for the Dutch government. They send over uh, over a hundred people uh, to Castle Craig, one of our best facilities. James will be able to tell you a wee bit more about that. Um, and the other, the other um, two hundred odds are in the third sector, you know, Christian organisations, church organisations, um, difficult to access as well. But only twenty two funded rehabs for the whole of Scotland. So if we want to follow the Portuguese model or have drug consumption rooms and do it in an evidence based way, the way that it's done in other countries, we have to make sure we have a robust treatment system in place first. Currently, we are a very, very long way away from that. James, I, I've heard you, or I've, I've read actually, um, you you write and, and talk about uh, sort of, you know the meth methadone treatment. And uh, forgive me if I'm misquoting you here, but uh, you know talking about um, uh, replacing an addiction with an addiction. Um, could you just give me your view on that? And, and uh, you know, is it a sticking plaster approach? Have we got that right? Do you fundamentally disagree with it? Wh where, where, do you st where do you stand with that? So, without sounding too controversial, um, here's the thing. If I go to the doctor with a drug problem and I'm opiate addicted and he prescribes me another opiate, have I solved the addiction? Everybody in here can answer that question herself. So it's replace one with another. The only difference is one's provided by the state, which is legal, and the other one I was accessing by illegal means. Now, it's my experience, Gary, that I'm over a decade in abstinence-based recovery. And prior to getting into recovery, I tried to access um, treatment, and the best they could offer me was a methadone prescription. Now, I was addicted to painkillers and I didn't want a methadone prescription. I didn't want to be... I knew I knew at some level that um, this would just be another addiction. I wanted free uh, substance dependency. I, want, I wanted... I want, and, I'm, and I'm not against um, prescribing methadone. It needs to be part of the treatment model. But in its proper context, where I was prescribed methadone was when I entered um, and by proper context I mean it was used to detox me from my dependence so I went into Castle Craig Hospital uh, I met a doctor in there who was in recovery which blew my mind the fact that actually doctors could actually be 
I never ever seen doctors or people who were middle. I never even seen middle class people. Never mind a doctor that was uh, chemically dependent at one point in his life and he'd solved the problem. And here he was prescribing for me. And he told me what the detox process was looked like. And I had no um, argument against him because this guy was speaking for his experience. And also he was a specialist in the recovery process that I'd entered into. Now, bearing in mind, Gary, when, when you're addicted, your mind and body is so badly sickened. Like, who you meet can determine your development. So if I meet somebody who's telling me that this would be the best option for me, who's who, there's a good idea, a good chance that I would buy into that. Now, I get detoxed in that hospital and found out I had multiple, multiple trauma in my background. And that, that if I didn't resolve my trauma, then there'd be a good chance that I might go back to what I was doing to try and resolve it, which was seeking relief in substance. And bearing in mind, Gary, I've got a child at this point who's now 17, who stays with me, who can't remember ever seeing me under the influence. Now, the process of me getting into recovery breaks the cycle of adverse childhood experiences. I get a chance to unravel and fuck that my child experienced. If they'd have left me on a prescription, it would have been a disaster developmentally for my child because... My child needs me to be emotionally attuned to her needs. And the fact, if I was dependent on a substance like methadone, if I was titrated up on methadone, my ability to be emotionally available would be limited because it's a mind and mood, mood altering chemical. So my mood's altered. And that affects your ability to be an emotional attunement to the needs of your child. So it would have affected my child, absolutely no doubt in my mind. And then... Um, I found all this stuff out later on, Gary. I should I shouldn't have needed to find that stuff out in a hospital in the borders that I had managed to get access to rehab and access funding, albeit under a different government, but under the current regime, I wasn't I'm not getting in there. If I'm accessing treatment today and I'm saying I want to go to Castle Craig, I heard it's really good, they address trauma and I wouldn't get the money to go in there. So the best they could so that's wrong. That's why I'm. That's why I'm so uh, vocal in this debate because I die, and my children don't get to have a father who can help support and buffer any sort of adversity in their life. So that's how big it is, and the difference that Dan was saying earlier on now is that it's a, it's a class. It, it becomes about class when if you've not got any money and you come from a poor area, you're not getting access to a place like Castle Craig. So that can dictate your how well you get or how or where you go in the, the process of treatment. That needs to change. It's aptly described, James, as the rich get rehab and the poor get methadone. Yeah, yeah. And the thing about it is, is I cycled through the care system, the young offender system, the adult prison system, and it spat me out the other side at 24 years of age, and then for a few years I wandered about aimlessly until I found somebody else who had solved the drug problem who told me that Castle Craig would probably be my best bet, that I shouldn't have been going through a system and getting the answer for somebody who had already solved the problem. Maybe that way, maybe it had to be that way for me, but um, I know who I would rather be meeting today. Somebody had solved the problem. I want to meet people who have solved the problem that I'm trying to overcome. That's the difference between getting well in addiction or staying uh, dependent on a system. Darren, your voice along with Anne-Marie and, and James is massively important um, because, you know, let's be blunt, you, you know, you've got the ear of the media. Um, you've got you've got you've got profiles, which is which is extremely important. One thing, Darren, I want to ask you um, when you look through the media, because I've not found this. Right. So so we, we you know, we, we you know, we've got the daily records talking about decrim and very. But I haven't seen any media talk about compassion or kindness or hope or caring have, have you seen anything that 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 resembles that in any of the media no but it tends to be that if you're paying attention to media you can you can observe 
there has been a softening of the the hostile rhetoric towards vulnerable people. You might find instances of a specific individual with a, a shocking kind of background or something terrible happens and it might flare up again. But generally in this particular area in Scotland, editors understand that partly because of this movement, partly because of new evidence that comes to light, uh, that people who present in antisocial ways, people who appear to be hopeless or destitute in some ways, uh, they are often uh, not just socially excluded, but they're dealing with multiple problems. Um, now, you're always going to have po pockets of hostility. Ultimately, if you want to change the way the media covers it, you don't go to the editors, right? There are already quite clear editorial guidelines for reporting all sorts of things. Suicide, gender-based violence, um, issues around uh, sexual expression, so on and so forth. Now, edit editors have, uh, they, they, they're not obligated to follow these guidelines, but the guidelines are clear. If you really want to impact editorial slants of newspapers, then you take your persuasive arguments to the public. You challenge the public because ultimately it's the public that dictates how the newspapers sound, how they feel, the general tone. Obviously there are very specific areas where proprietorial control will come in, right? But generally when we're talking about social issues, editors believe that they are very in tune with the values of their readers. So in Scotland, I believe it's, it's, it's markedly less hostile than perhaps in some places down south and maybe in Wales. Um, I, can't, I can't explain why. Uh, maybe it's not just the drug deaths that we're pioneering. Uh, you know, I think there are po positive aspects to this. But just to go back to the, the methadone thing, around the methadone issue, um, I think you see the convergence of, of, of various interests and aspects that speak to the wider dynamics of the debate, including just some of the logical fallacies. So when someone uh, wants rehab, they have to wait. But if someone needs methadone, they can get on it straight away. If someone relapses on methadone, we up their dose. But if someone relapses when they come out of rehab, then we say rehab doesn't work. Hmm. And, and so, you know, when you, when you, uh, you begin to understand the attraction to methadone from the perspective of government, because you're talking about a physical product that can be tracked in terms of when it's manufactured right until it's uh, administered. Um, but even though it's a physical product and even though people are tracked in terms of where they're at and if their dose is decreased or increased, the government never really knows how many people are actually on it, you know? And I think methadone and pharmacological approaches like that um, would certainly be far more useful if there was a clear pathway off of it, which is currently what we lack. And I think the reason many of us in the recovery community become frustrated is not because we have a beef with methadone or we look down on people who are, are, are on methadone prescriptions who are overcoming serious addictions or because we're against science or evidence-based and all this. It's simply that it is morally uh, and medically unacceptable for someone to be on methadone for any more than a few years when you can be safely detoxed in a residential treatment centre within a week and a half. It just mm. makes no sense. Uh, uh, uh. And what about um, and forgive forgive me here because it's uh, you know I, I do come at these interviews certainly from a, a layperson's point of view and this is why we've got you know experts like you on the panel here but this emergency treatment which uh, which is new to me uh, nal naloxone is that correct yeah so you you talking to James. Uh, sorry, Darren, I'll stay with you for the time being and then I'll come round. How, how do you, because this is a, from what I understand, it's, a, it's an, a, an emergency treatment that saves lives. Is that correct? Yes, it's one, look, it's a very important thing, right? Naloxone is very important in the same way that safe consumption rooms are very important. But there is an overabundance of focus on these 
quite frankly, sidebar issues to the fundamental questions of how we deal with addiction. These treatments are the last stop before death. Yeah. Right. If this is the central focus of discussion, and I understand why it is, especially with media, you know, if anyone out there will be familiar with the work of, of Peter, Peter uh, Kraken, um, who has, has made a lot of personal sacrifices in terms of promoting the safe drug consumption rooms, the sort of safe drug consumption rooms that, that do save lives. And so the media are drawn to this because they have a, an individual with a personal story and a lot of cool page furniture in terms of how they can present that. And so that's something that a tabloid can sell to its audience. Here is a guy, here is what he's doing, here is his journey, right? A lot of the other recovery stuff is a bit more complicated than that. So it creates a situation where when we talk about uh, these drugs that you're referring to, which are really important in that particular drugs, re re reverses the effects of an opiate overdose, okay? Um, but what happens then? Ask Peter Kraken, where does he send them when he saved their life? There's nowhere to send them. <laughs> they go back to the rat-infested lanes with human feces and garbage uh, where they came from. And, and, and within a couple of hours, they're going to be trying to get more heroin. So, you know, I, I do think that these, these, that these are important, but ultimately what we're wanting to talk about is something that's a bit more ambitious than what do we do when a person is one breath away from death. So, Anne-Marie Ward, if I can come come to you. So, in in what what can we do? You know, what what is in your mind? How can we drive ideas forward to get people to listen? Uh, the decision makers uh, in terms of budget. I mean, Darren, obviously, uh, as as you are, and James is very passionate about this. But what 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 is the alternative? Is there a is there a plan in your mind? What should we, what should people be listening to? The decision makers. Well, it, you know, it's not necessarily an alternative. Like, like Darren was saying, we need drug consumption rooms. We need naloxone. Um, but when you look behind the, the curtain, what we see is that, you know, there's there's nothing else, really. Um, drug consumption rooms and, and so much press interest in that, and I understand why they're interested. But it's a bit of a red herring when it comes to actually helping people get well and even saving lives because there, it, there's so little people, you know, so so small a number of people that would have access to the drug consumption room. So they're offering, they're, they're suggesting that we build a £2.4 million purpose-built facility in the city centre. Um, this was pre-COVID, of course. Um, now, to my mind, if you if you were really genuinely wanting to help people use safely, you would have you would have those facilities in every health centre, in particular in the areas where people are dying in the greatest numbers. So in Possel, in Fergusley Park, you know you would have access in the communities where people are dying because also on the naloxone point, sixty percent of people who died last year of an opioid overdose were alone when they died. So no one could administer naloxone. So, I mean, it's great that we flooded the communities and we have a Scotland-wide naloxone programme. But if you look at the toxology reports of where, as well of the drugs that are killing people, it's cetazepam and cocaine, which are the two most significant high, you know, the, 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 it's those two drugs that are the most, you know, increasing within the toxology report. So we don't have an anti to it has a plan the street volume or uh, cocaine at the moment. And if you're asking me where do we need to go forward to, to help people get well, it has to be an admittance. First of all, we need to admit that there's a problem, right? So we need to take an inventory uh, of, of what's missing. And for me, the most common thing that's missing is access to trauma-informed services and access to residential and community rehab. And I'll just finally say on the methadone uh, question, if you like, methadone, when it's done well and when it's done in an evidence-based way, has three components. You are titrated up to an optimal dose. You are then detoxed off. And, and the third part of that is 
whilst both of those things are happening, titrated up and detoxed off, you have psychosocial support. Now that's where the evidence base is for methadone, right? If you're doing all three elements of that, you're providing evidence-based treatment. We're not providing evidence-based treatment when it comes to methadone. We're giving people a script and that's all they're getting. They're lucky if they get to see the same worker once a month. Um, yeah. yeah, and often, just to quickly add, often, when you uh, when you apply critical faculties to this sort of practice, you will be uh, you will be rebuked very aggressively by medical professionals in the medical yeah. establishment who fall back on this evidence based refrain. Of course, ignoring the contextual factors that Anne Marie has just articulately outlined there, and and so what they will do is they will they will then cite a person who is addicted to methadone as an advocate of their own treatment. But only with methadone does being addicted mean that you are regarded as a rational, functional person who is able to advocate for your own treatment, despite the fact that you're addicted to methadone. You couldn't have someone advocating their own diazepam prescription. You couldn't have someone advocating their own heroin prescription. It would be seen as Silly, wouldn't it? It would be seen, clearly you only want this because you're addicted to it. But then medical professionals will hold certain people up who have been on methadone long term as poster children for why it's an evidence-based treatment, which to me just makes no sense if you if you have the understanding of addiction that I think the three of us do. Yeah. Um, can I, can I, I'll come to you in a second, James. I just want to pick up on something that Anne-Marie said that I found was really interesting. It's about admitting we have a problem. So is that, a, are you suggesting that we as a country aren't recognising that we have a problem or certain areas of our society don't believe we have a problem? I think, um, yeah, on two, two different answers there. I think Nicola Sturgeon just admitted that we, we have a problem. I think she just did that a couple of weeks ago, so that's important. Now, whether her admitting that will filter down into the professional classes, you know, don't forget there's a lot of uh, what I would describe as sclerotic and inert leadership in the Scottish addiction field. Whether they will admit there's a problem remains to be seen. Um, I think, secondly, uh, denial, of course, of addiction, and you mentioned other addictions other than substance use earlier, I think Scotland has a particular penchant for oblivion, that we have normalised oblivion. Uh, it's completely normal for, to grow up in a family in Scotland. Even people who think they don't have a problem to be obliviated two or three nights a week. Uh, you know, for the middle classes, it might be bougie. For, for the working classes, it might be beer and vodka. But that normalisation of addiction is really problematic. And I think there's a tremendous amount of denial around that culturally, yes. James, uh, I've just got a, a few more questions before we wrap. And as always, our 60 minutes goes very quickly. We may go slightly over. Uh, James, how do we become a more compassionate country? Um, that is a really, really... Good question. So I think it needs to begin young. So we know that, um, that the optimal rear environment for a child is an emotionally nurturing environment with, that's enriched with safe adults. And that also means that we would need to look at basically school. So there's a massive emphasis in pedagogy in school. And we we need our early years needs needs to become places of attachment, Gary. So it basically means that the attainment needs to focus on the role of um, emotional intelligence, empathy building, rather than just uh, content and course material. So we'd really need, to, really need to look at the early rearing environment because empathy is a empathy is like a muscle that you need to train and you need to train it into people young. It can be developed later on, 
but it's really difficult. So it needs to start young. And also for me, um, the this is what's missing as well, Gary, but this is getting played out massively. There's a... The legal system doesn't understand addiction or trauma. And there does the medical system as well. So if it doesn't understand the role that trauma plays, then how can it apply solutions to a problem it doesn't understand? So currently, our medical and legal profession do not get trained on trauma at all, unless they specialise in it, unless they take a personal interest in it and go and specialise in it. And that's not about blaming anybody because that's not their fault. So that harm that they might be causing is done unwittingly. So our justice system needs to wake up to the reality that it's it's wasting taxpayers' money trying to punish people well because it isn't going to happen. And it's like I said earlier on, that's why Berlin isn't the best rehab in Europe. And you only need to look at the research on how much of the population of Berlin is addicted. So you'll never punish people into wellness. And I like this. Um, I actually wrote it down, and it's child psychiatrist and trauma specialist and brain researcher Bruce Perry. Any early years trauma specialist or a worker or a, who's got an interest in trauma will know Bruce Perry. And he says, if we create environments that are safe and predictable and relationally enriched, then all of the other factors involved in substance abuse and dependence will be so much easier to dissolve away. Our challenge is to figure out how to create these environments. The possibilities would be truly inspiring if we were to channel the energies and the billions now squandered in the war on drugs into building an evidence-based and humane rehabilitation and treatment system. Wow, that's it for me. Now, we can talk about it. People are shouting about evidence base all the time, Gary. I would like to see more practice based on the evidence. No, the shout about evidence based practice. More, more practice based on the evidence. All the evidence, not just the particular evidence. It suits. It suits your organisation or services agenda. Absolutely. My final question. It's the same question for all three of you. Um, uh, Angela Constance, uh, who is uh, the new Drugs Minister for Scotland, uh, she's only been in, in the job a very short while, and we hope that she gets to see this. We really do. But just one message for Angela, because I'm sure that she has a massive opportunity to make a, a massive difference in the face of a, an awful lot of uh, adversity that's going on at the moment. But one, one, one bit of advice or one message to Angela you would give her, given your background, your knowledge and your expertise. Anne-Marie. Yeah, I'd say, Angela, we're, just, we're not just graduates of adversity here. We're not mm. just experts by experience. We are living, breathing examples of being able, uh, uh, human beings who are able to reach their full potential. There is much to learn from us. There is much love uh, and much compassion and empathy to be learned from hearing our stories. Our stories have real power. And please, 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 I beg of you, focus on two things. Access to the different pathways to recovery treatment-based, medically-assisted recovery and abstinence-based recovery. And secondly, give people a choice of treatment and do not punish them if one path to that treatment does not work for them. Let them move freely between the, the, the pathways to recovery. And if they fail, give them more and more chances to get well. Please just give us chances to get well. 22 chances 22 rehab beds for the whole of scotland mm. is a national scandal please sort that darren a message for angela constance um really just to sort of echo what the uh, Anne marie and james have said i am concerned about this false dichotomy uh which is seen as you know the pharmacological approach methadone all of the institutions around that, uh, 
are, are evidence-based and driven by science and that those of us who talk about love and talk about compassion and talk about the healing cohesive effects of human connection <clears throat> are regarded as sort of part of some kind of new age mutual age mutual aid cult <laughs> there's more evidence for the power of social connection and love and parental attachment than there is for any drug right so let's just get that straight um <laughs> what we have to understand is that um yeah, what we have to understand is that you can change the personnel here, but imagine these institutions that have produced and reproduced the same failure over and over again as like a piping system, right? And imagine the, the, the resources and the expertise flowing through it, being channeled always in the same places, the same access points. What we need is we need the whole plumbing system refitted, Right, it needs to be torn out. It needs to be put back in because it doesn't matter if it's Angela Constance. It doesn't matter if it's Nicola Sturgeon. It doesn't matter if it's Barack Obama flies in and becomes the new drug czar. If the if the same structures behind all of this remain the same, and the same people advising government ministers remain where they are and aren't challenged in some way and don't feel that slight rub of feel that a person would if they knew that they would be held accountable, uh, then things aren't going to change. And so that's ultimately what I see is the more root and branch uh, long-term goal here. But there are things that we can do even within this particularly decrepit uh, model. Yeah. And James, final word to you, please. Um, I would say... Angela put the money back that was taken out of abstinence-based long-term residential treatment because that's the safe places that enable the process of people being returned to themselves and that allows them to access the psychosocial support on leaving these places in the community that maintains and sustains the process of being returned to themselves. And in the process, they will go and support other people and return them to themselves. And like Dan says, it will just be this cycle of social connection and is the antidote to addiction. So how do we up the social connection in our culture and also um, create a model that's got the power to explain the exact nature of the addiction and the trauma that underpins it so that individuals get a full knowledge of their condition I shouldn't have needed to wait to go to Castle Craig Hospital to get a full knowledge of my condition. Um, and also, let's have viable, easy and fast access to all the modalities of healing and recovery that can, and that, that can be applied across all the services. That's very simple. How can it be applied across all the services so that people are operating for a framework that they don't need to go from one postcode to the next and the framework and the process changes, that it's a unified response to the problem of addiction. That is an illness that deserves to be treated as an illness and the recovery process needs to be easy accessed. Well, I've got to say, James, uh, Anne-Marie, Darren, thank you for... Uh... Uh, an inspiring and, and powerful 60 minutes uh, of a conversation and you've given us all plenty to think about uh, going forward and keep keep flying the flag for Scotland you, you you do an absolutely wonderful job and thank you for being so generous with your time this evening um, to everybody who's watching either in Scotland or in the rest of the UK or around the globe thank you for joining us today and we'll see you very soon take care bye-bye thank you god bless